Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Beth Sanford. I'm on, the, I'm on the board of the New Canaan Land Trust, and one of our favorite properties is the Firefly Sanctuary, which some of you may know, and we hope it, that you might sign up for some of the hikes that we're going to have up to see the fireflies the first week of July, which is July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. But what the Land Trust does is we oversee and steward almost 400 acres of open space in New Canaan. And one of our missions, which we've really elevated to be more and more important to us, is to engage the community in our natural resources. So as we were looking forward to kind of the peak season of the lightning shows that Fireflies put on, we said we'd really be wonderful if we got a, an expert to come here and tell us everything that we should know about fireflies. And we were lucky enough to find Dr. Christopher Kratzley, who is here tonight from Pittsburgh State University. He served, serves as a professor of biology, uh, interim de de depart <coughs> department chair of biology and chemistry, and graduate program chair for biology and science education. He res, um, received his bachelor's degree in biology um, at Brown University, his PhD um, in biology at Tufts, and among other interests, he has devoted his research to studying fireflies and is actively involved in the Firefly Watch Citizen Science Project. I think one of the things, and just reading a little bit up about Chris, is he has developed research and applied embedded computer system to determine the ecology of firefly flash behavior. So <laughs> we're going to learn a lot that you probably never th knew when you were a child looking at those fireflies in your backyards. And, um, and I hope that you will think about signing up for the hikes we have. We also have an, um, an app that you can download and get a map of the firefly sanctuary. And it's on it's, uh, Avenza. And we have that all listed on our, our website. So. I will introduce Dr. Kratzley. Thank you very much, Beth. Can you hear me all right on this mic? Excellent. Thank you. So yes, I'm Chris Kratzley. I'm so glad to be here. I think this is the first community I've been in in the United States that has a dedicated firefly sanctuary. I've, so congratulations. That's wonderful. I've been to some in other parts of the world, and I'm so glad, uh, glad to see one here in the United States. I hope we have more of them in the future, as we'll be talking about. I have a few things that I want to try to accomplish uh, today with this talk. And the first and most important one is to make you all aware that when we talk about fireflies, we are talking not about one species of organism. We are talking about worldwide thousands of species of organisms. We're talking about in North America about 200 different species of organisms. Um, and so I hope you can walk away from this talk with some appreciation of that diversity and as a result also of the incredible importance of preserving that diversity. We'll certainly focus on those species that we can find here in New England, but we'll also compare that to what's around the world uh, so that we can understand why our ones in New England are so unique and important in some of the things they do. So um, I'll give one, whoops, one other warning, uh, which is that there is some data in this, but I'm going to try to make it all as accessible as possible. But uh, I don't think I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't show you some of the science behind all of this, because uh, that's what I've been actively engaged in. I, I realized giving a presentation like this a couple weeks ago um, I've been in, actively engaged in it for um, about 20 years now. So I said, boy, that really made me feel old when I realized that. So, um, so let's take a look at some things about fireflies. That should work. Okay. So we're going to start with the question of what fireflies are in your backyard. It, show of hands, who, who has fireflies in their backyard around here? Oh, that's fantastic. That, that warms my heart. That's wonderful. And, and maybe you'll walk away with some sense of what fireflies you have there. Um, but also to think about um, the important story of what firefly predators you might have. What might be there that's eating fireflies? That's part of the fascinating story of fireflies, as we'll see. So when we talk about fireflies, 
I mentioned there's many different species. And so what we see here, um, each of these is a different genus. So again, at the risk of throwing science at you, uh, we organize species, multiple species, um, into genera. That's the plural of genus. Um, and so the fact that here, when you go out in your backyard, you might see up to three different genera of flashing fireflies. That can start to give you an idea of the diversity because each of those genera has multiple species in it. And these are the, the three genera that you'll find, Photinus, Phaturus, and Pyractamina. And you can actually tell them apart by looking carefully at them. They all have the same basic body design. Um, they're all beetles. Fireflies are beetles, which means they have of the two wings, insects in general have two sets of wings. The outer set is hardened. That's what gives beetles that hard shell. We call it their elytra. And so fireflies have these elytra that are, tend to be black with these yellowish margins. And you can see the same thing, whether it's a photinus, a phaturus, and a pyractamina. They also have these modified sort of head plates. Um, we call them, again, scientific name, pronotum. That's their pronotum, this shield over their head. Um, and fireflies in general have a black band down the center of that shield, pink on either side, and then it, it gets lighter on the edges. But one of the ways you can tell a, these different genera apart from each other um, is in these patterns. Because Photinus, I think of, this is the most, arguably the most diverse group of North American fireflies, the Photinus. Um, and so I think of their body shape as being sort of the standard that I compare the other ones to. Whereas both they and Phaturus have those yellow margins around the pronotum. Pyractamina, the pronotum gets dark again at the edges. So if you capture one of these, take a picture of it, look at it up close, you would be able to tell a Pyractamina from a Phaturus um, and from a Phaturus by that um, darkening to the outer margin of the pronotum. Phaturus, as we'll see in a minute, you can often tell because they are larger and because their legs tend to stick out further. But you can also often tell them because they have light stripes down the middle of those dark elytra that we don't see in Phaturus and Pyractamina. So that's a little bit, if you catch one and you look at it closely, those are some of the things you can do to see, you know, what do I have in my backyard? Do I have all three of these, oftentimes you will. Do I have two? Do I have one? Um, so that's one thing that you can do. And then if you look even closer at them, we can see a few other um, differences. So one of the important differences I already alluded to was the size. Here's two Photinus fireflies, a Photinus male and female mating. Um, and here is a Photinus male and a Phaturus female. You can see how much larger the Phaturus female um, is than the Photinus male. And that Phaturus female is eating that Photinus male. <laughs> so um, now we, this is why I said uh, we need to know about the predators of fireflies. It turns out fireflies, in particular Phaturus, are predators of other fireflies. So Phaturus uh, preys on Photinus. They also prey on Pyractamina, both of which tend to be substantially smaller in size than, the, than those larger Phaturus. So that's an important difference. Also, if you want to take a close look at their lanterns, um, this is a really great view of a lantern. Virtually every, uh, you know, all of the species of Photinus, Phaturus, and Pyractamenas, the males have lanterns that look like this. They occupy two segments of their abdomen. Um, they're completely filled with what we call light organ, uh, the parts of the firefly that produce the bioluminescent flash. Females, on the other hand, don't have lanterns that completely occupy those two segments. And depending on the genus that we're talking about, there's slight differences. So Photinus females really have a lantern that only occupies one segment and only sort of a dot in the middle of that segment. Phaturus females do have lanterns that sort of almost occupy those two full segments, but not completely. Their lanterns occupy just a part of those two segments. And Pyractamina females have lanterns that occupy just the outer edges. So another 
way that you could tell these genera apart if you were to capture a female, which, by the way, can be very hard to do. Um, and the reason for that is that most of what you're seeing out there when you're watching these fireflies in your backyard, and I'll try not to stand in front of that, are males flying and advertising to females. They're seeking mates. Um, the females, particularly of Photinus and Pyractamina, those females tend to stay perched in the vegetation, not fly, and respond with bioluminescent flashes only when they see a male flash that is in some way appealing to them. <laughs> so um, that means it can be challenging to see those uh, females, to find them. You can go out with a, a pen light and you can try to flash like one of the males and watch for female responses. Um, but it's challenging, especially at this type of season, because in this time of season, there's lots and lots of males out there and very few females. Um, the good news is, is if you're interested in seeing a female, um, that the females do stick around longer than the males. So as the season progresses, if you continue to watch fireflies in your backyard over the course of the season, or wherever you go, if it's firefly sanctuary, um, you will find that at the end of the season, there may be very few males, but if you flash like a male, you might see five, ten different females all respond to that flash because there are no other males out there to respond to or there are very few of them. So, um, so there, there is an opportunity as the season ends to maybe have a better chance finding a female and certainly I encourage you to look for them. I encourage you especially to look for not just using your own flashes, but try to watch and see if you can see this courtship dialogue taking place. Watch the male's flashes and see if you can see a female response because when that happens, the male lands in the vegetation and this dialogue can go on for five minutes as the male flashes, the female responds, until finally he locates the female and they begin to mate. So that's, um, it's really fascinating to watch and it is evolution in action in the sense that the success of that male in mating we think is ultimately what has shaped, as you'll see, an incredible diversity of flash patterns across different species. So why are there so many species of fireflies? Well, in part, it's because over time, in different places, in different subpopulations, different flashes have been particularly attractive to females, have been particularly successful at finding females. Different codes have emerged. Um, because you can't actually look at a Photinus male or female, Viturus male or female, or Pyractamina male or female, and tell the species just by looking at them. You can tell those genera apart, but within each of those genera, telling one species from another just by sight is almost impossible. You can only tell them apart by their flash patterns, and that suggests to us that their evolution has very much been an evolution not of, you know, within, within genera, not of different body sizes, not of different body shapes, not of different body colors, not of any other characteristics, except evolution of different flash patterns. And something else, actually, the other way you could do it if you spent a lot of time and studied very hard was you could dissect them open and examine their internal genitalia and tell them apart that way. Um, those are the only two things that have evolved differences within these genera um, between these species. And so that's kind of hard. You have to look in a microscope. They're, they're pretty small. So I recommend using the flash patterns as the best technique. OK, so, um, so there are three genera of bioluminescent lampyrid beetles um, you are most likely to encounter, Photinus, the predatory Photurus, and the Pyractamina. And um, I. There's one important note here. We say lampyrid, bioluminescent lampyrid beetles. So um, the lampyridae are all of the fireflies. And there are some that don't flash at all. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So you may find something that has all of those, that body shape that I've described to you and those body colors, but is, um, is not, uh, not a bioluminescent firefly. And so it belongs actually to a different genus not represented here, because we're focusing on the ones you could see at night. That's what we're most interested in. So 
here's another interesting fact about these fireflies, and here's the first data. Okay. Um, this data is really important for me to show you because it tells us why Futurus fireflies eat Photinus fireflies. Why does that happen? The story is fascinating as to why that happens. Because it turns out that fireflies in general, especially Photinus and Pyractamina fireflies, taste very bad. You, nobody's tried it? No? Okay. Um, so uh, they have a chemical called lucibufagens that make them taste bad. It turns out that at least for a couple of species of Futurus we studied, they don't make lucibufagens. The Futurus can't make lucibufagens themselves. And so what we can see is that an unfed Futurus, if we take a Futurus, rear it in the lab, and it hasn't been fed a Photinus, it has no lucibufagens. This is a graph just showing amounts of lucibufagens in micrograms per beetle. Um, if we feed it a Photinus, it has plenty of lucibufagens, and that's the chemical structure of a lucibufagen there. Um, so that seems to be the reason that they are eating Photinus. Now certainly there's other things they get, nutrients, but it's critically important that they get these lucibufagens. Why is that? Um, well, if they get the lucibufagens and we present them to spiders, if they are unfed, the spiders eat about half of the unfed um, Faturus. If we feed them the Photinus, the spiders won't eat them at all. So again, that chemical defense is very important for these Faturus. Um, and then finally, not only is it important for them, and this just shows um, you know, that the, the more uh, lucibufagen in, there is in them, the less likely they are to get eaten, um, but it's also important because they put the lucibufagens in their eggs. Here in dark is lucibufagens. And these are the Faturus eggs of the Faturus that have been fed. You can't see it, but that's a plus, meaning they've been fed. If they have been fed, they have plenty of lucibufagens. Um, the Faturus can make another chemical called, that we call betaine um, that does offer some protection to their eggs. And it, there's not getting any betaine from the, um, from the Photinus. If they don't eat a Photinus, they have just as much betaine as if they do. So, fascinating story. We have Fireflies that taste bad protect them from predators. The, really the only firefly predator are these other fireflies that are preying on them in order to get these chemicals to defend themselves and to defend their eggs. So in summary, males and females of each genus have different lanterns, we saw those, and Faturus females prey on Photinus and Pyractamina in order to obtain chemical defenses that not only protect them, but they can provide them to their offspring too. And I will say that this is one of the things that is unique about not just North American, but North American and South American fireflies. Firefly, there are no fireflies like Faturus found in the Old World, found in Asia. There, we have the only predatory fireflies here in the New World. So that's, uh, if you see that happening, it's something that you can only see here. You can't go see it in other parts of the world. All right. So what about other things that might prey on fireflies? Well, um, if we think about it, one, what, what do you see in your backyard that might prey on fireflies? Anybody? Okay, birds might prey on fireflies during the day and at night, bats. Um, and so uh, we've shown in many studies that fireflies taste bad to many of these vertebrate predators, like bats and like birds. Um, but what we weren't sure about, you know, the, the birds are active during the day, so we don't think the flashes of light are so important, but we wondered, were the flashes of light important in warning bats away from fireflies? So this is a, a crude sketch of an enclosure we built um, with a camera in it, uh, and a special lure unit, and again, another crude diagram of it. Um, you heard about the computer systems we use to try to simulate firefly behavior. Well, we have one of them in here, and then a, a motor that spins around and a little firefly lure on the end of it. The idea was to test bats 
and see if the lure was flashing, like a firefly, whether that would deter the bats from eating them. And we would fly them in this enclosure and see what happened. Um, so here's the bat that is most interesting from this regard. It's the big brown bat, incredibly common around here. Um, scientific name, Eptesicus fuscus. Um, and it, it's interesting for a couple reasons. First off, it's again, probably the most uh, common one in this in New England. Also, because it is somewhat of a beetle specialist. It loves, coleoptera are beetles, it loves beetles. Right? This is a, a measure of how much of its diet when we, um, well, so this is an interesting story. If you want to know what a bat's diet is, <laughs> I'm so glad I had, this is, Paul Mooseman was my postdoc, so he had to do this. I didn't have to do this. Um, you catch a bat, you put it in a bag, and it's pretty scared, and it poops in the bag. Then you collect that poop, and you dissect it under a microscope to identify what insect pieces are inside it. And that way you can determine that most of the insect pieces are beetles, and you can also determine that none of the insect pieces were fireflies. Um, and we found that it was the chemicals in the firefly that was uh, deterring these bats from eating them by taking fireflies, crushing them up, and painting tasty little mealworms, either with firefly blood, hemolymph is our fancy word for it, but, um, or sometimes we called it firefly homogenate. That sounds much more scientific than crushed up fireflies, right? Um, and we could also put crushed up um, darkling beetles, the adult beetle of the mealworm, uh, onto that. And we've found that, you know, the mealworms were very tasty to the bats that we had in captivity, um, even when they had adult darkling beetle homogenate painted onto them. Um, but when we did the same thing with crushed up fireflies, they hated them. They spit them out, they rubbed their little snouts, they did not like the taste of these uh, fireflies. So, um, so, okay, great. How do they avoid eating them? They're flying around. They're using mostly echolocation to locate things. But that's another reason why the big brown bat is important. Because the big brown bat is not blind as a bat. As one of the biggest bats, its vision is not great. But it has some of the best vision amongst bats. And so we thought if there was one species that was likely to potentially use firefly flashes as a way to avoid them, this would be it. Um, and what we found was that we also wanted to compare two different lures, one the size of a photinus and one the size of a photurus. In general, it didn't matter whether we turned the lure on or off. They really didn't. This is um, log, tr log transform mean attacks per pass. So how often for each time they flew through that enclosure did they attack a firefly? And in general, they didn't really attack or a lure of a firefly. In general, they didn't really attack much at all, um, regardless of whether we had them flashing or not flashing, if they were small lures the size of Photinus. But if we made large lures the size of Photurus, well, they attacked both flashing and non-flashing, um, but they were much more likely to attack the non-flashing lures. So Photurus are out there protecting themselves two ways. Right? They're protecting themselves by eating Photinus so that they taste bad and hopefully spit out, perhaps, by a, a bat. But also, they're protecting themselves because their flashes, the bats are somehow learning that those flashes taste bad and not attacking them. Um, and so, um, in general, one of the things we think is important about this is that we, we think that this would drive the evolution of really high flash rates and, and very obvious flash patterns, particularly in species like Phaturus because they're using it not just for what I've already alluded to, mating, but they're potentially using it as a way to defend themselves as well, as a way to warn predators. So in conclusion, um, bats, particularly the big brown bat, Eptesicus fuscus, prey heavily on nocturnally active beetles. However, firefly chemical defenses deter these predators. And there's some evidence, especially for the bigger ones, that the flashing behavior deters predators as well. So back to our question, what fireflies, hopefully you have a sense of the different types of fireflies in your backyard, and that one of them is predatory, 
And that really, the other things that might eat fireflies tend not to and tend to be protected from attacks, A, by the chemical defenses, and B, by the bioluminescence itself. And we think that's why the bioluminescence initially evolved. We think that the first evolution of bioluminescence was as a warning signal. Just like if you think about so many stories of poisonous snakes that have bright colors, or even poisonous butterflies that have bright colors to warn predators. Uh, we think that the bioluminescence of fireflies may have evolved initially for this reason. All right, so now we're gonna zoom in instead of on um, these three genera, how could you begin to appreciate this diversity of species that's out there? As I mentioned, it comes down to their flash pattern. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a few diagrams like this. Uh, and in these diagrams, we have time on one axis for males and for females. And then these dark boxes represent a firefly flash. So a Photinus marginellus produces flashes that are about a half a second long and repeats them about every three seconds. Photinus pyralis produces flashes that are almost a full second long and repeats them about every five and a half seconds. And what I've highlighted here in yellow are a number of species you might find around here. Marginellus, pyralis, ignitus, consanguineus greeni. We'll come back to look at them a little bit more carefully in a minute. But um, the really important thing to know is, again, another clue to the genus is the color of the flash. Most of the Photinus fireflies have generally yellow flashes. Oh, that color did not turn out the way I thought it was going to. Um, this is the uh, a series of pyractinina patterns. That was supposed to look kind of orangish. It def definitely doesn't because they have amber flashes often, not always, and that's why I say some vary. But if you see this one in particular, um, Pyractamina borealis, if you have a habitat where there's some woods, the name borealis means they're found in the woods, and they produce an amber flickering flash. It's not really, the flicker's not really represented well here, but, um, but that is, you can see there's a little bit of a modulation to it as they flash. So, um, and then finally, and again, this color didn't turn out that well either. Uh, we meant to look greenish because um, Futurus fireflies often have green flashes. And one thing, one that's very characteristic that you often find around here is Futurus versicolor. Um, it produces trains of multiple flashes. If you see anything out in this area that is producing generally, well, let's say four, five, or six pulses, and then repeating them again, it's almost always Futurus versicolor. Just a, a little bit of insight. But again, the colors vary from um, genus to genus. They don't tend to vary too much for species within a genus, although there are some exceptions. And again, I've said a, they can vary somewhat. Okay, so flash patterns and sometimes colors vary between species. Photinus are generally yellow. Pyractamina amber. Futurus tend to be greenish. So another clue for you. But to really get down to that species level, you have to look at those flash patterns and see, do I have different flash patterns in my backyard? Am I looking at different species of fireflies? And again, we think that the diversity of fireflies has emerged through evolution in different directions towards different flash patterns. Here's a little bit of the terminology that we use for flash patterns. So the flash pattern has a, the pulse has a duration pulse duration, that's one clue. That's hard to tell because they all tend to be less than a second, but you can see that some are shorter duration and some are longer duration pulses. And then the flash pattern interval, if all they produce is a single pulse, then the flash pattern interval is a second important piece. How long before that male flashes a second time? Can you count off in your head as you're watching one flying there? One Mississippi, two Mississippi, Three Mississippi, oh, there's another flash. Okay, that's a clue to me about what species I'm looking at. Warning, it is temperature dependent. So uh, as it gets colder, they will come further apart. As it gets warmer, they'll come closer together. But, um, you know, again, if you have two species in your field, 
the, the differences will stay fairly consistent. You know, one will be shorter flash pattern interval, shorter pulse duration. Another will be longer flash pattern interval, longer pulse, uh, pulse duration. And then the, the other thing you can use, if, and I mentioned how hard this is, but if you can see a female respond, get her to respond to your pen light or watch her respond to a male, the female response delay is also species specific. Each species has its own response delay. The females time their responses, and again, you could count it off. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, and see how long did it take before that female responded. So for pyractamina, that's basically the information we have to try to de decipher which one is which. How long are, are, how long are those flashes? in duration, what's that pulse duration? Could be very short for Lucifera, a little longer for Borealis, very long for Linearis. Sometimes Sinuata just keeps going, that's why that's white because it's variable, but sometimes it's very, very long. And then, or does it flicker? And I mentioned that Borealis flickers, but it's not represented here. Some flicker a lot, like Angulata and Dispersa, really, and that's what this is meant to represent. They flicker, but you have, so you have a duration of either a pulse or a flicker, how long is it? And then what is, how quickly is it repeated? So Borealis, every little over two seconds. Lucifera, every five seconds. Occluded telling them apart. And then, if you can see the females, how long till they respond? Do they respond like a half second after the male flash, like Borealis? Do they respond a second and a half after the male flash, um, almost instantly after the male flash, although there's some question about uh, the, they are hard to find those females, so some uncertainty. But those are all the clues that we can use. So pyractamina males um, produce single pulse or flickering flashes that differ in duration, flash pattern intervals, and female response delay. And that's, if you're looking at them, you try to look for those differences to see. Do I have one species, two species, three species in my backyard? Now, n there are other fireflies, particularly in Plotinus, that produce multiple pulses that they repeat. So here's a double pulse species. Pulse, pulse, and then wait, and then pulse, pulse. And so for those, there's another measurement that we can have, which is we call the between pulse interval. How long is the time between there that can help to distinguish them. And um, there could be even be triple pulse or quadruple pulse species, but in each case you can imagine it's that same idea. What is the time between those individual pulses? And so Photinus has a lot more diversity, and this doesn't even begin to represent all the species of Photinus in North America that you can find, but we can see that some of them have single pulses repeated at regular intervals like marginellus or pyralis, or ignitus. Some have double pulses repeated at regular intervals. And you can see not those double pulses may come very close together, like within a half second, maybe a second and a half apart, or even two seconds apart at a particular temperature. And so you can start to tell the species apart by that. Some of them have even more pulses, like consim consimulus and carolinus, um, but we tend not to find these ones around here. Again, I've tried to highlight ones that are common around here. Um, and so that's why I say if you see something that's pulsing four or five times around here, it's probably a Faturus, Faturus versicolor, because Consimulus and Carolinus are, don't tend to be found around here. But one thing I should note with global warming, I guess eventually all bets are off. These are all species that are found further south from here. In fact, I've even included this one, Pyralis, which I never include in talks in Massachusetts because it's never found in Massachusetts. But you guys are kind of on the border of where we might see Pyralis. And in fact, we're very interested to find out are Pyralis perhaps spreading with global warming further and further north. Um, and so not only does it have a very long duration single pulse, so not quite a full second, but um, but the other thing to watch for with pyralis is when it flies, it creates a J shape when it's flashing. So it's flat, you see it, it flashes on and flies upward and then turns off. Flashes on, flies upward. Um, and so it's called the Big, big Dipper Firefly by some. 
um, J-shaped flashes, very characteristic, and so I'm fascinated, I'm looking forward to seeing tonight um, whether I see any in this area, because again, haven't seen any in Massachusetts. I studied them down in New Jersey, um, and so I, I know they're not too far away, but we'll see. So that's, uh, those are the uh, Photinus. And so for Photinus, you need to look at not just whether they are, what the duration of the flash pulse is and what the flash pattern interval is, but also whether it's a single, double, or even multiple flash pattern. Um, and again, you can use female response delays. Finally, Faturis. Fair warning about Faturis. Faturis are not always going to flash the way they're represented on this chart by, that Barber put together back in 1951. Um, and that's because, I told you already, they hunt Photinus. But one of the ways they hunt Photinus is by mimicking Photinus flash patterns. And so if you're out there and you think what you've seen is a Photinus or a Pyractamina, um, you may instead be seeing a Faturus and you'll happens to me all the time, and I'm very used to catching fireflies. I catch something, I think, oh, well, that's probably a Photinus. And then I look at it, and it's enormous relative to a Photinus. Um, they're, they're still pretty small, but they're, they're much bigger, as you saw in that earlier image. And they have these wide legs, which is what they use to catch and eat the Photinus. Uh, they look different, and I thought, oh, another Photinus fooled me. Because they don't always produce these patterns. But you can see they have a wide range of patterns. Um, and, uh, but the one that I did highlight for you, because uh, you'll see them often, especially flying higher than Photinus, um, that would give them away, produce the uh, Faturus versicolor, produce these trains of multiple pulses. So, so that's kind of my biggest take home message about Faturus. There's a wide range of flashes, and sometimes they mimic Photinus. But if you catch one, you'll definitely be able to tell that is not a Photinus once you've had a little practice in seeing both kinds. Okay, so the last thing I want to tell you about here, and then I would love to have your questions and, um, and take some time for that. But I do want to tell you, um, now that I've set the stage for this diversity and what's out there, what is it that we're concerned about in terms of preserving them? And what can we do to make a difference in it? Um, the first thing I have to say, uh, truth in advertising, we don't know what's happening to firefly populations. We have people telling us all the time, well, I don't see them the way I did when I was a kid. We have lots of reason to believe, based on plummeting uh, numbers and diversity of all kinds of species across the country and across the world, that they are being threatened. Um, but we need a way to actually monitor that. And that's where the citizen science project I'm involved in, Firefly Watch, comes into play. Um, because it's an effort to actually engage people like you, people who have fireflies in their backyard or somewhere nearby that they can go study them, to actually track them year after year and tell us what's happening to the populations. So, um, and this is where I also want to talk a little bit about what's happening around the world. Because as I mentioned, you guys are pretty special here in the United States in doing something that they're doing in other countries, which is starting to set up places to preserve fireflies. Um, and so what are they like across the world? How can we preserve them? Well, first off, let's talk about North America. Um, this is the range distribution of fireflies in North America. They are an eastern group of organisms. We do not find the, and again, important caveat, the bioluminescent flashing fireflies. We do find daytime fireflies, again, with no flashes on the west coast. But Otherwise, they are restricted to you know, Midwest and East, except for some that we also find down in um, the Rocky Mountains, especially in the southern part. But that uh, that's, gives you a sense of where we find them. Um, and I mentioned we find them in a lot of different varieties. Uh, and so this is color-coded to show that um, many, like the Photinus that we've looked at, um, like the Faturus that we've looked at, are producing discrete flashes. In other words, flash, flash, flash. Others, represented in this amber color, just glow. And so there's a number 
the of species, and again, this doesn't represent the full diversity. This is just to give you a, a tiny snapshot of it. And then others, as I alluded to, are non-luminescent. Lucidota atra, Alichnia californica, and the Alichnia caresca complex. So this is the one that's found out on the west coast, as its name suggests. Um, and then both this one, Lucidota atra, and the Alichnia caresca complex, those are found here in New England. You'll find those um, in your yard. They'll look otherwise like fireflies, but they won't have a lantern. So. And frankly, I think we should care about that diversity as well. Um, it's just that the techniques and tools we have right now for trying to think about how to survey fireflies and find out if they're still around really relies on seeing them flash. And so that's a hard, bigger challenge for them. Um, I mentioned this before. This is an illustration of it. Look how similar. Now, you can see some differences. But look how similar a Japanese firefly looks to the North American ones we saw. Now, we could tell it apart. It doesn't have the yellow margins around the elytra. Um, the pronotum is pretty similar, though. Uh, there's not huge differences. Its lantern, again, is that characteristic key. Um, the female lantern, in this case, is a little different. It fills a full one. Uh, firefly larvae look like this. They pupate in the soil, or depending on the species, different places, and then they emerge as adults. Let me tell you a little bit more about our fireflies here. So the larvae are what we would call glowworms if we were to find them. Um, most species were not likely to find their glowworms because they're down in the soil and they're pretty small. Um, but again, Phaturus, as the biggest um, genus of fireflies in terms of physical size, uh, if you find a glowworm, you're probably, around here, you're probably finding a Phaturus glowworm because they tend to, if it rains, come up out of the soil and you can see them, especially in the spring because that's when their larvae are the biggest because they're getting ready to emerge, go through this pupation and emerge in the summer. The other important thing about firefly preservation is that these adults are only around for a very short period of time in almost all the species. They're around as adults for two, three weeks, maybe a month. Individual fireflies that we've followed live on average about a week in the wild as adults. They live as larvae in the soil for one year, sometimes even two years before they emerge as an adult. Um, and they don't always live in the soil. Uh, here they do. Our North American fireflies are all in some kind of soil. But fireflies in Japan, for instance, their larvae can be aquatic or semi-aquatic. They can live in, in, through Asia, they can live in uh, salt water or fresh water. So there's a range of habitats that we have to think about protecting if we think about protecting firefly um, around the world, certainly. Because they, but that, for us here, that soil environment and that year of growth and development in the soil is critically important. And that's where we think um, that a lot of the impact on fireflies can be happening one of the places, and we'll talk about that. But, um, but we think that the way we treat our land, are we going to mow it? Are we going to use pesticides? Are we going to use herbicides? Maybe impacting those fireflies. Because in that soil, those fireflies are the top predator there. They are eating earthworms. The firefly larvae are eating earthworms. They're eating other soft-bodied invertebrates, the grubs of beetles, other beetles. They are, those are grubs, technically, because they are beetles. But the grubs of other beetles, um, they have uh, these sort of fangs that they stick into the other uh, soft-bodied invertebrates and suck out the juices from them. And, uh, and so if you think about it, those top predators, whether it's a wolf or whether it's you know, a shark or whether it's a firefly larvae, don't necessarily think of those in the same sentence usually. <laughs> um, but those top predators are often most susceptible to what happens to all of their prey. And they're most likely to be wiped out if their prey is in any way damaged. Um, and of course, they're, most li they're likely to be affected by other factors as well. We think that um, because of this range of aquatic to soil larvae, um, well, we, we know that the larvae, not just think, we know that the larvae, even when they live in soil, are very, very sensitive to the soil moisture. Um, and that's one of the reasons we, you know, we're concerned about 
having very tall grasses or you know, other shrubs and not, not having manicured lawns because we know that the soil dries out so much then uh, and the conditions are not necessarily good enough for fireflies, larvae then to survive. Okay, um, and this is just an example of a glowworm. So you can see what, you know, what it looks like when it glows, although this one is from Malaysia and happens to be about the size of your thumb. This is a giant firefly larvae, uh, and it happens to have two lanterns on its belly there. So. Okay, so there are over, over 2,000 non-luminescent glowing and flashing species, often with similar looking larval pupil and adult forms. Um, and so what we wanna do when we think about fireflies, what I'm really concerned about is that we think not just are they there or are they not there, but that we can answer the question that I've just been trying to teach you a little bit about, which is which ones are there? Can we preserve the diversity of them? Uh, it would be great to always have fireflies around. It would be even greater to always have so many different species with so many different flash patterns. That's why I encourage you to look at the range of flash patterns you have. That's why in our Firefly Watch citizen science project, we want people to not just tell us, do I see fireflies or don't I? But how many different flash patterns do you see? Are you looking at many different species in that field? And is that changing over time from year to year, even if you're still seeing fireflies again and again? So, um, so here is a, uh, a detour um, briefly to Southeast Asia. Um, this is right outside of Bangkok. And they have done what you've done here. They've set up a firefly preserve. And uh, the firefly preserve in this case is right along the river. Um, and that's me on a boat. Uh, you can see it's, not, it's a pretty industrial area there. Um, but what the fireflies do is they live in mangrove trees along the water side. And so they've tried to make efforts to preserve fireflies in areas like this. This is where I went to study them on this pier here um, next to the mangrove. More pictures of the pier, more pictures of the pier. This is what they look like. These are the Southeast Asian fireflies clustered around, crawling around. And what's fascinating about them, this is a species called Pteroptic, Pteroptix malachi is that they flash synchronously. An entire, one of, well, an entire really mangrove tree will light up simultaneously, <laughs> all of the males flashing in synchrony. It's really remarkable to see. We're still trying to understand how that particular behavior evolved. Um, and so I use it though now as an example an example of what I hope that we do. They've taken this time to try to set aside areas for these species to survive. Now, in part, admittedly, they do it for tourism. They've, they've tried to turn it into a tourism industry, not just in Thailand, um, but also in Malaysia. Um, you know, also, I think uh, I've, those are the only two places I've been to see them, but I think there's some in Indonesia as well where they've tried to set up these preserves for them. But we can do that same kind of thing. Um, fireflies live in this incredible range of habitats um, around the world, whether it's soil, fresh or brackish water. Um, and the adults may be very habitat specific, like mangrove forests or like we see here, some species that live in open fields, other species that live in the understory of trees, like the Pyractamina borealis I mentioned. So how do we need to think about protecting their habitats. And I definitely applaud the land trust here for the work that, they, that they're doing to do that, and I hope we can keep doing that. Um, the last thing I'll show you, because protecting the habitat is one thing, there's one other, and as I mentioned, that means ma maintaining the moisture of the soil, that means you know, avoiding pesticides, herbicides, keeping the plants uh, growing naturally the way they are. But you heard about our embedded computer systems. Um, this is one of them here, Sparky 2.5. Uh, they are artificial fireflies. That's the lantern, the light emitting diode. This is their eyes. Um, and it allows us to program them to behave like a firefly. We call them virtual firefly instruments or VFIs. 
Um, and what it lets us do is see how important the flash behavior is for their ecology, for their survival in a particular habitat. Here's a particular experiment where we have platforms, and those platforms can have nothing on them. They can have a firefly program to act like a single female. A firefly program, and remember that means she's just gonna respond every now and then. A firefly program to act like a single male, you know, flashing spontaneously. And a firefly programmed um, to, or not two, fire, two virtual fireflies, programmed to act like a male and female in one of those courtship dialogues. And what we know, what's, uh, what we can find is that fireflies, in terms of their flash behavior and how it impacts their ecology, and it's, it's probably not surprising, are attracted to other fireflies. When they're out there flashing, uh, they're not just looking for a female, they're looking for other flashing males. So that control treatment where there was no firefly, nothing came there. A lone female attracted some fireflies, a lone male attracted slightly more fireflies, although there's a lot of variation there. And then those pairs of fireflies dialoguing attracted the most fireflies. This is why there's one other thing that I urge you, and that is what can we do about light pollution? Because this, their ability to aggregate, their ability to be attracted to and form these congregations of flashing is dependent on their ability to see each other. They're out there actively looking, but if, and of course this wasn't done with light pollution, this was done with just not having any fireflies, but if they can't see fireflies, they're not gonna go there, and that's really critically important. Um, and so uh, we did something similar, I won't go into too much detail, with the fireflies from um, Southeast Asia where we modified the pulse treatments um, and in this case, we showed something else interesting. It's not just that, that they have to see each other. In this case, they are attracted most when they are in synchrony. This is not, treatment number one is fire, four virtual fireflies flashing synchronously at the rate observed in the field. And so they rely so heavily on that ability to see each other and that ability to have that pattern preserved. Um, and so they, you know, they're very concerned about boats coming by with lights. Again, disrupting a pattern, causing the fireflies to spread out because they're not seeing that consistent synchronous pattern that they need in order to flash. And of course it affects how often, here's showing how often they approach, how often they land, and how often they then join and create their own synchrony. They really require um, those synchronous flashes to be able to see them and to respond to them. So in conclusion, some species like Pteroptix malachi demonstrate that astounding synchronous flashing, but they all rely on these flash patterns to recognize and aggregate with their own species. And if we disturb that, then we're threatening fireflies as well. And so I say, please, keep it dark, last piece of advice. Okay, so um, these are a lot of people who helped with all of this work um, uh, from, uh, t from Tufts, Fitchburg State, and elsewhere. Um, there's a huge list of them, a couple of grants from the NSF that I always have to thank, whoever I'm talking to. But now I really want to, um, and I know I'm sort of at the end of my time, but I'm happy to take more time to answer any questions. So we'll start right up front. Um, so the, it has a long duration flash, um, and you can imagine that it doesn't want to fly, t I mean, this is my theory, I, I haven't had a way to test this, but it, you can imagine though it wouldn't want to fly too far during that flash to miss a female response. So I, it's sort of like just a hovering motion. It's, going, it's flashing and it's hovering up so that it can then, that's my interpretation, so it can then see a female flash. But I don't know for sure. I haven't tested that to see how that could change if it flashed in a different way. But I think it's, it's just so that it can observe females. Yes, a question in here. <laughs> That's a good, good question. That you have the stumper question. Uh, Teroptix, Faturus, Fatinus, Pyractamina. Well, one of the reasons. Oh, the, sorry, you didn't hear the question. 
She wanted to know, why do they all start with P? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, one, part of it goes back to Latin. Uh, it's another language that we, that we use for science, and nobody uses it for anything else. <laughs> Although, uh, no, again, if you're going to go to a school that studies Latin, I'm sure it's very important. Uh, one, one of my daughters went to one where they're still required to study Latin. But, um, and pyro, the prefix P-Y-R-O, pyro, refers to fire. And so for some of them, like pyractamina, that explains it. Now it doesn't explain it to all of them. Teroptics, that's not it. Um, and I think photo means light, uh, which is so photinus and photurus come from that, light. And, a, and, a, and a, a single quanta of light we call a photon. And so there's another place where scientists have used that photo light. And you have, okay, we could go on with other uses of it. But thank you for that great question. And I'm going to have to figure out some of them because it's pretty puzzling. Yeah. Could you talk a little about the bioluminescence? Sure. Yeah, so, um, so it's a chemical reaction. Fireflies have a, an enzyme called luciferase. Um, and the enzyme called luciferase binds to a, another chemical they produce. This, we call it the substrate, the chemical the enzyme binds to that's called luciferin. So these two things are reacting, luciferin and luciferase. And they're reacting, they need two other things present for this to happen. They need oxygen present for the reaction to occur. And they need a, um, a chemical that's sort of the ubiquitous energy source in cells. It's called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, and you can mix those things together in a test tube and they will go, it will glow. Uh, it, you know, essentially the luciferin uh, molecule, its electrons are excited to a higher state. They then decay down to a lower state, releasing a photon of light when that happens. Um, and that happens again and again and again as that reaction continues to be catalyzed by the luciferase, caused to occur by the luciferase. But the oxygen needs to be there and the ATP needs to be there. In fact, People have used this as a cellular marker because you can take the genes for luciferase and luciferin and you can insert them into cells. You can do some little genetic engineering, insert them into cells, and you can see um, then whether the cell, if you expose it to oxygen, whether it's alive, whether it has ATP production going on. Because if it does, the cell will light up. And people use this as a, as a biological marker in experiments often. Um, so it's something that uh, while it is unique, this particular form of bioluminescence with luciferin and luciferase is unique to the lampyrid beetles. Um, it, the firefly, uh, it is, um, you know, it's a chemical process that we can make happen in a test tube or in other cells if we want to. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Well. The first thing I would say, um, and this is why we ask people, you know, I asked at the beginning, if you have them in your backyard, well, if you've got them, then you're doing something right and keep doing it, right? Don't. <laughs> um, but as I said, I, I do think that um, if we had to point to certain things, um, and part of our Firefly Watch project, it, we ask people at the site they're reporting on, you know, are they using pesticides? Are they using herbicides? Is it being mowed? Is it being hayed? What are the things that are um, happening to it? Uh, is it near a source of water? Fireflies tend, again, so our, they, as I said, they, need, they seem to need moisture in the soil. And you tend to find them close to ponds and streams. Um, and so although they're not aquatic larvae, they seem to have some of that need for moisture in the soil. Now part of that, again, is the prey species, that the prey species will be more abundant if the soil is moist and um, and I've also heard people talk about a you know, having a lot of dead organic matter because, of course, that's going to feed the earthworm and the fireflies are then going to feed on those. So I, I say, you know, don't mow, don't put pesticides, don't put herbicides if you can avoid it, um, and, uh, you know, and keep that dead organic matter. Don't, you know, let that continue to build up. So those are my recommendations. And if you have a source of water, keep the source of water going um, and, uh, and make sure that, you know, in those ways, 
We try to keep the conditions the way that seem to be working, hopefully, if you've already got them. And so, hope that answers your question. Yes? What, uh, aside from like eating drugs and stuff, what other beneficial roles does firefight, fireflies play in the ecosystem? So, I, I think of fireflies. Um, yeah, yeah. So obviously that's always the first one. Um, I love fireflies for entertainment. I love them for education too because um, they tell a fascinating story about the natural world um, that often brings people in uh, in a way that talking about something else might not. But beyond that, in biologically, um, I do, I, I am, we're hopeful, especially through this research, that we can see them as a little bit of a canary in a coal mine. Again, those top predators, and again, that's the shark, <laughs> the lion, the wolf, and the firefly larvae. I want you to think of those together, right? Top predator in their habitat, in that soil habitat. To me, they're a marker of, is that soil healthy? Is that habitat healthy? And if they're disappearing, that to me is a sign that something, something is wrong with that habitat. Um, in the same way that, you know, that another top predator in a habitat provided it wasn't actively being hunted by humans for some reason, uh, would be a good sign to us that, okay, is that predator, is that habitat healthy that it can maintain that top predator in the habitat? It means all the other pieces down the food chain below it are doing okay. Um, and so that's, that's what I think of them as, as a real value to us to look at from a, from a biological sense. Um, and obviously, like any predator in a habitat, if you remove it in some other way, like through light pollution, um, that can have a, an impact on the things below it. I mean, we've seen, we saw when they removed wolves from um, Yellowstone that um, the habitat began to change dramatically because the deer were running rampant. They began to erode, the hillsides began to erode around the rivers because the deer were foraging just wherever they wanted. And then they reintroduced wolves and that habitat then began to transform again as the deer not just were killed but actually had to avoid riverbanks and those riverbanks could grow up vegetation again. And so fireflies could be serving that same kind of purpose. You know, what will ha you know, you know, we think of earthworms as great, you know, why would we want to kill them? But, um, but certainly some of those other soft-bodied invertebrates um, could be, if they're taking over a habitat, if grubs are taking over a habitat that might otherwise be fed on by fireflies, that may further the, the de deterioration of that habitat, of that soil. So, okay. <laughs> Just one more question. I'm sorry, uh, and uh, let's go right here. Ah, wow, great question. I can't believe I didn't mention that. So you heard what Phaturus are eating, right? Uh, they're Phaetinus cousins, but, and Pyractomita cousins. But um, the truth is, um, for many of the species, especially around here, we don't think, other than those Phaturus, that they're eating much of anything. Um, you know, you, when you go out in the field, where a firefly field, you can go to, you know, this flower, that flower. Uh, I mean, the natural choice for them would be to feed on uh, some form of pollen from a flower there as adults. Um, and we know that we can, they have functional mouth parts. Uh, they use them to drink droplets of water. They can get nutrients if we give them like a slice of apple. Um, in, if we're trying to keep them in captivity and it makes them live a little bit longer, they're getting a little bit of sugar. But, um, but the problem is that they have uh, a very narrow window of time when they need to mate. And um, our sense is that, especially here in the Northeast, with a limited season, uh, all they want to do is just rest, preserve their energy, and then they will, um, you know, they'll just come back out the next night and do their best to mate, but they're not really concerned about eating. Now, there's one other reason for this in females, um, and I'll zip ahead to that for a second. This is what we call a firefly spermatophore. And male fireflies, when they mate with females, don't just transfer sperm. They transfer this nutrient-rich spiral package that contains the sperm. And females have an internal organ that allows them to digest this internally and use it to provision their eggs. So females are, in fact, getting nutrients every single time they mate with a male. 
Um, and so another reason not to be foraging necessarily, uh, wasting energy searching for food when you hope it will come to you for the females. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry I didn't have time for everybody's questions.